Okay, welcome to everybody. I hope I can inspire you a bit with the photographers we're going to talk about. Uh, this is half of my presentation because I have a very, very long presentation on, on fashion, famous photographers, which starts from the early ones on to the late ones. I'm going to do more of the later ones because that way you'll know them a bit more. If we have time, not today, and another time I will, I will work on the older fashion photographers, some of them which are unfortunately not with us anymore. Okay, so let's start, let's start. Okay, and we'll start with, an, with a name which I'm sure everybody of you know, knows, knows his work or uh, has seen his work. Uh, you'll also see that um, I have put in brackets uh, the, the date of birth of the photographer and if he has died also the date of, of that. That is to put things much, much more in, uh, in context for everybody. Uh, I consider Evidon one of not only me, I mean, a lot of, a lot of uh, researchers and, and on photography consider Evidon Poe to have been a very pivotal figure in fashion photography. Why? Because when he came on the scene, he changed a bit the way that photogra photographs of fashion were being shot. And you'll see why. Um, at the beginning, most of the fashion fashion magazines and albums uh, were, if you would see the, the photographs of Vogue um, and, and magazines that type, you would see that everything would be like sort of very, very unnatural. Everything as, as portraying lifestyles which were really not, not really the lifestyles of that day and very stiff poses. Avedon started to change all that by going on a, on a style which predicted more of a, a sophisticated lifestyle, but at the same time, real life sort of situations. They would never be real life situations because everything was, as you know, in fashion photography, everything is nearly st staged. There, there is very little that is not staged because everything is planned before. Uh, but most of his photographs and those of others who followed his style later later on um, started to move away from the sort of doll-like static pictures and even started introducing movement. Here, in fact, you can see some early work of Avedon who started, you know, even getting out of the norm. Uh, where we see, for example, the two main main characters, and the, she is actually the main subject that's that's the the clothes that he's showing but he's not just really showing just the clothes he's showing a lifestyle he's showing something happening he's even edging away as well on 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 the sexual um, angle to to attract more people to to look at pictures remember that i think nearly all photography particularly fashion and commercial one needs to be su successful one needs to stop people in their tracks so that they look at the images and then a trick and any item and any prop is good to stop people to look at your picture because that is actually the battle and today it's much more much much more that way today why because the millions of photographs we are being bombarded with we are all used to seeing very good pictures every day so to stop people in their tracks to look at your images one really has to pull out all the stops. One has to invent things to stop people uh, to in their tracks so that they see photographs. It's becoming more difficult and more difficult because of what's happening with all with all the pictures that are around us. Uh, but that is mainly the same system which was at the beginning as well. Uh, this picture, as you know, uh, is quite famous. He actually, Avedon, this is not his... Uh, idea. Uh, it was actually the first per person who shot it this way was a, a certain photographer who was a, migra an, um, a Hungarian m migrant to America uh, who, whose, whose surname was uh, Hoynigan Hume. And Avedon actually, actually made this his own picture. A lot of people who see this picture think that Avedon was the um, originator of this picture, but it wasn't. It was Hoyninger Hune much before the, the, 
the arrival of Everdon. I also like to, where, where I find, I like to put the year of the photograph because, again, that gives us an idea of the difficulty to choose, shoot that picture. You know, when um, uh, shooting fireworks in 1900 was a totally different thing than shooting them in 2000 with today's equipment. So whenever, even uh, it's a tip that I like to give even to everybody who's listening to my lectures, etc. Try and put in a date if you are putting in a photograph, even if it's your own photograph in a PowerPoint, because that date will, will say much more, will explain much more on that actual image. Okay, these are all photographs of uh, Avedon, and here we see even uh, Avedon was a very great portraitist, and as you know, he shot most of the great stars and personalities of, of his age. Uh, here is where Avedon really started breaking new ground. Uh, as you can see, this picture, if it was shot before Avedon's time, it was very difficult, if, if impossible, to see an image, a fashion image like this, because they did not uh, introduce movement and certain things. Because who saw this picture? For example, if you would be a magazine, a fashion magazine editor before Avedon started feeding them these images, they would say that the dress does not look right. It's like blown up, but Avedon used to more try and show a lifestyle that people wanted than an actual, what the actual dress looked like. Okay, I mean, it's, it's the case of sort of, um, if I buy a t-shirt, which is a branded name, then a t-shirt from somewhere else, more or less it does its, its own functionality, the same functionality. But if I show that, that the t-shirt, the which is expensive, which is a branded t-shirt, in a context where people would like to see me, if, I, for example, I'm on a yacht or something like that, then that sings more with whoever wants to buy that product. And this is what Avedon was working uh, on. And naturally, uh, one thing uh, that uh, I, I don't know, I, in fact, I, I did go into some deep research at one time, and I'd like to do a presentation, another presentation eventually, Marilyn Monroe in her time, as you know, was one of the most figures that every photographer who was worth his salt at that time, American, English, whoever, French, took photographs of her. Okay, and uh, that is another thing that, uh, for example, Everdon came out with the photograph on the left, which was actually taken of Marilyn, not posing. He was taking... Uh, a studio shoot of her for, for, for some publicity for a film. And it was a break in the shooting where he actually snapped her without her knowing. Uh, as you know, Marilyn uh, had a very, very difficult, uh, difficult life. And, but she could, for the cameras, you know, she could pose and, and do, show any, anything which, which she wanted to, to portray to the cameras. So although there are hundreds and thousands of pictures of her, there are very few who have really captured her worry or her, the way she was really in the background. And this picture is, Avedon is quite famous uh, for it, actually. Again, you see here, which was, it, it's, it's not a typical image that, that we, we were used to seeing fashion. Today, yes, today we still see these types of images, which I would call weird, because weird draws attention. Okay, so here, Everton was much before his time, and he started going weird and strange when nobody else was, because again, here, it's not showing uh, much of the dress in detail. Before, they used to try and light the dress so that you could see exactly the seams, the cut and everything. Uh, but here, Avedon just goes away from that, forgets, forgets the, the actual dress. It's just there as a prop. And he's just trying to make a statement with movement, with, with action, etc. Uh, here he is, this is a picture while he was, he did a very, very famous, you'll, you'll find it if you search on internet, a very famous uh, photo shoot, which was uh, done in... Uh, in Sicily, and he even did did some work also in in Japan and China, which which one can look them up. Uh, Avedon is for for somebody who's studying fashion, he's one of the people you need to really look at his work. For example, this is again a fashion style. 
Um, she's actually, it's more of a makeup uh, than, than a statement of fashion. And it's, he's actually showing, showing a real life situation which, where clients or people who bought the magazine and were into fashion might relate themselves to it, to that situation. Uh, he was also remember that, uh, that uh, today, looking at this image, it's quite easy to do it. With, uh, this is actually Audrey Hepburn's face. Uh, it's actually very easy to do it today with digital, but at that, in those times, Avedon was working with the darkroom. So all this was done and manipulated uh, in the darkroom. All right, very difficult by taking different pictures, cutting the faces out, and then introducing those shadows which look like actually she's dressed in something, but they are actually shadows done in the darkroom with, with cutouts. Again, you can see how creative uh, he was. Another image which is quite strange. I mean, I'll, I'll move a bit on. An earlier Avedon image where he's, he's putting a bit of fun in it. As you know, humor is very important for photography. Why? Because we all like to see something that makes us smile. We have enough problems on this earth living. So if something makes us smile, we are automatically pulled towards looking at that picture. And humor is one thing that you should always try to put in your images, if, if possible. I know it's very difficult. Nothing is easy, but if you can imbue your pictures with just that slight little humoristic twist, then uh, you're on to a winner. Okay, again, a very, very famous shot, which where, where Ravedon got his models to play around on roller skates. And we're talking uh, early fashion after the, after the war. Okay, we're talking 60s. As you can see, as well, the movement. Notice one thing as well, the positioning, the viewpoint of Avedon. He didn't do the mistake I see a lot of people doing when, kept, when taking photographs of people, that they shoot from their own level. And what would have happened if, the, if he shot from upper, they would have started merging with the buildings at the back because the buildings would go up. All right, he's taking them from down there, giving them a larger than life situation, shooting from below and also outlining them against a plain, plain clean background. Thus, the actual um, subject comes out much more uh, with power, much more powerful. Uh, this is one actually of the of his set in Sicily, uh, down in Italy, and he really put the, the models actually in situations. You can imagine, you can see all these faces. They seem to have never seen a woman. <laughs> in those times in Sicily, you know how the Italians are with all respect to everybody. So imagine putting models there at that time and shooting uh, what was happening around them. So uh, this set is very interesting as his, his China, his, his set in China. They're very interesting because he used the same system, putting models into places where very, very few, I mean, the people were, were reacting in a way because they hadn't seen this done before. Uh, this one is a stage shot, quite, quite famous as well of his. It's quite of a later stage shot. Um, for me, although it's technically very nice and even the lighting, etc., I don't think it's as powerful as, he, as some of his middle career images where, where the images look much more natural than these. This one for me looks rather, much rather, it's, it's very staged. But then uh, naturally, Avedon had to pay for his food and drink. So he would sometimes, like we have been uh, in a lot of situations, we have to please our client. Okay, more, more images from Avedon. And you can see that one thing which, which shows uh, his, his, uh, his strength as a photographer was that he changes the, type, the way he shoots, but there is a certain style in his images. I don't know if you've noticed. Uh, particularly in the, in the middle to latter part of his career, this style is definitely there. You start seeing the images and you think it's, it's Avedon. Another famous picture of his, of Twiggy. As you know, Twiggy was, is considered to be the first supermodel uh, in the world. Um, every, uh, like Marilyn Monroe, everybody was shooting her. Every photographer who, 
wanted to make a name for himself would shoot Twiggy, would try and get to shoot Twiggy. And this is uh, Avedon's, one of Avedon's pictures of her. Something totally different. Okay, uh, here we have Picasso, a portrait by, by Avedon of Picasso. And I think he really brings out the character of the man. Um, I've read a lot of on Picasso, I've studied a lot on Picasso. For me, that is him. That is him. Uh, arrogant, powerful, strong, stubborn, and I can see it all in that picture. It might be my mind because I've, I've read all, a lot on, on his work and life. I've always tried to understand some of his work, which I still can't understand. Uh, but that's me. But I think with this portrait, um, he's really hit the nail on the head. Uh, now, this was uh, some dancer or, or I think, uh, a musician, so some, somebody of the punk era. Buster Keating. So, you see, so his career was very long. He's, he's taking pictures. We, you were seeing images of uh, stars, which were quite quite early or early on in, in, in their career. And then others who are closer to our to our genre. Another one, another portrait, which I think uh, is again very powerful of Hitchcock. As you know, Marlon Brando at his best. Uh, a fashion model who was very, very popular in UK between the 60s and 70s. I think you can all see why. <laughs> and Dali. Some, somebody who nearly had more photographers taking pictures of him than Marilyn Monroe and Twiggy together is Dali. Dali knew the power, the power of the photograph, and you'll also notice that Dali was photographed by nearly all the top photographers of his, of his life that, while he was living. Uh, and he became famous because of the way his portraits were, were, were taken. Dali was, a, although he was a very difficult character when actually taking photos in a studio or with a photographer, but then he would put on a show for the camera. And if you, if you look, even if you go on Google and say, you know, Dali portraits, you'll see what I mean. Because most of his images, he's acting, playing up to the camera. And the images, and usually, as you know, Dali was a very big surrealist. Uh, he went for the weird as well. Because remember, weird can capture attention. Again, he did, Avedon did a lot of uh, Gucci. This one is another another famous shot of Nastasia Kinski just starting out in her career. Uh, the story goes that Avedon says that he only managed to get this one shot from the shoot because she was afraid um, the snake was going all over the place and not where he wanted it. But this shot sort of was the, the best one he could get out of this uh, difficult shoot, naturally. Okay, so that's about Avedon. Let's go on another, for me, big name, Helmut Newton. Uh, he was a German who actually resided in, uh, in America. Remember that after the Second World War, after 1945, a lot of the top photographers from Eastern European countries and even West German and Germany had emigrated and, and fled to America. And America, after the war, the photography changed in a big way because they had all these, this influx of photographers coming in from a lot of other different countries like Czechoslovakia, Poland, Hungary, Russia, Germany. So the scene of in photography changed in a big way in America and they actually evolved. As I always say, uh, the more you mix with the talents of other countries, the more the mix becomes better. Okay. And in America, it was, it was this that lifted their, their photography way above after 1945. Same as, same as all the scientists went to America and started working there, it was most of the good photographers went there and started there. And Helmut Newton is one of them. Uh, Helmut Newton, what amazes me a lot is that he would not, 
he was not really a technical photographer. He actually used very, very basic equipment, camera and usually a lens or two. A lot of times he preferred fixed focal length lenses. He rarely used flash and he never used studio lighting. <laughs> But what amazes you, and if you look in depth at his photographs or, or any of his books, are the ideas he came out. All right. He loved women. He loved to portray women uh, in a very sexy manner. He was very much borderline at times. Um, as you can see, from example, this, this uh, picture okay, of one of his, his photographs. But he was different. He was different. I mean, today I would not accept all that rubbish up there, you know, but the, it's the idea. Look at the idea of what's happening in his pictures, which is a totally different than what was happening from other photographers. Uh, Helmut Newton, as I said, was very much helped by his wife. His wife would be usually nearly always with him at uh, photo shoots. It might be she didn't trust him, which I don't blame her. <laughs> <laughs> but... Um, she would even help him and help with the models, etc. But his work is totally different. This is a very, um, how do you say, rare fo photograph of Helmut Newton because usually he would work in black and white. There is not a lot of color work around. But again, I wanted to show you a bit of everything. Always look at the date when possible, 1966. We are saying uh, 60 years ago, okay? Again, this this type of things. It was not technique that that he he just and he is known to to have to manage to get people who would be really difficult to pose in clothes or something like that, but to get them to pose even in in classical nude pose poses and stuff like that. He was he was he was very well known for that. I mean, again, you see here that a lot of uh, the stars that we've seen later on in films and even at that time. Uh, Newton photographed them. Again, look at the idea. And this is an image which would be 1970 or 65, something like that. It's the idea. It's not, uh, he, he didn't go with a truckload of equipment. Uh, if anybody, in fact, um, Newton is also known for having published the biggest photography book in the world. Uh, it's enormous, it's very big, I wouldn't know the dimensions, but it's nearly as big as, as me. And in fact, you buy it with a stand, <laughs> because you can't, you can't put it on a table and flip the pages. Uh, it's called Sumo, the, the book. Um, recently, a German firm took it, got it out again in a smaller version. And in fact, I managed to buy, buy one. Uh, you will not buy, be able to buy the original big version of Sumo, because its price is... I, I, can't, I don't remember, but it runs in 2000s. Uh, again, uh, a famous model of his time. This is Linda Evangelista. She was uh, American, very sought after by all the, the top photographers of that time. Uh, here you see a, a typical pose. I mean, it's a model shot. It's a portrait uh, done in a street. I mean, Avedon was like that. He, would, he wouldn't really look for studios or setups. He would really try and shoot in, in situ. We come to another totally different photographer who is French. Uh, his name was Guy Bourdin. Now, this is a guy who I, his photographs for me are amazing. Why? First of all, although he was in that era where a lot of people were using black and white, he really knew how to handle color. Okay, he died unfortunately quite young. Um, he was rather a recluse, and he died alone by himself at a quite uh, um, early age. He was quite sick, unfortunately. So um, his his work was curtailed quite early. But when he was working, he was very prolific. And if if any one of you wants to study how color impacts a picture. Go on this guy, and you'll start seeing. Uh, Guy Bourdin, again, wasn't such a technical, technically minded person. Again, it's the ideas. And you'll notice that most of his work are like sort of taken from uh, thrillers, from film stills. It's like part of a film still, uh, or 
actually they compare some of his work like a police criminal photo. And if you start seeing, you'll know what I mean. Okay. I mean, the ideas and the way he used color <laughs> were, were, for me, are, are incredibly creative. Now, this is, was, a, was a campaign for, for, a, for a designer, 1979, okay? Again, look at the way he photographed. You cannot not, not engage with the pictures. You can't just move to the next one, as we usually do with a lot of other pictures. His images call for stopping and studying them. Okay, again, look at the color. This was a Pentax calendar. This was something similar to, to Pirelli. For example, for me, this is a, a master portrait picture, you know, from nothing. This is a clutch bag and I, I, I think this, I, I'm not sure what this is. It's like a cloak, but again, design. It looks very much like inspired by Japanese photography. Another photographer, American, Bert Stern. Stern as well was, uh, although he was born in, in America, he was from German parents. Uh, and his work is again very important to see. It, he was also very well known, I think, for his Marilyn Monroe portraiture. And again, you'll see. Again, Audrey Hepburn, everybody took photographs of her, as you know. So she is always uh, figuring in some of the top uh, photographers that took images. I think uh, Audrey Hepburn, if you were a photo, if you were a photographer and managed to get Audrey Hepburn looking bad, one had to pack up his photography because she, she looks good in any way you look at her. I'm sure that even waking up after a bad night, she would look good. Elizabeth Taylor, again, another famous model. These are all uh, Stearns' pictures. Kate Moss, who came after Twiggy and became more or less took her place as, as Britain's top model. Uh, Stern worked a lot with with uh, with filmmakers as well, and he would he would do a lot of stills of famous films that we that we saw. Again, okay, nineteen sixty one, and you can see that it's a bit of a different. It's a, a bit similar to Avedon, but a bit more uh, staged. Because here, I think the difference between him and Avedon here, the clothes are are still coming out as the main subject of the of the of the picture, and not the lifestyle. A famous picture of Bert Stern with Liz Taylor and Richard Burton, uh, and uh, Stern, one of the, in fact, is known for uh, the last photo shoot that Marilyn Monroe took was actually with Stern. There are a lot you'll find nearly the whole, if you want to, to search on internet, you'll find uh, nearly the whole contact sheets of her, of the pictures, and you'll see, especially, uh, in fact, just six weeks before her death, she was putting up such a show for, for the camera, and then God knows what was passing in her private life, because it was just a month and a half before she let's say committed suicide, as one does, still doesn't know because of the conspiracy theories. These are coming from actually that shoot. This is an earlier shoot of her. We're seeing the contact sheet of 99% uh, uh, six by six Hasselblad. As I said, Marilyn could play up, play to the camera, uh, so there was no, no, no reason nearly to. First of all, she wouldn't take much direction because she, she, she really made the life of even film directors very, very bad. She was always late, always missing her lines, etc., etc. And in front of photographers, so she would play to the camera. It was better, I think, to leave her do her own thing than try to tell her what to do. She, she really knew how to, she loved the camera, as you know. Uh, 
As you see, these are all Bertstein's images. The, the last two are from uh, the last shoot, actually. And this is actually the, the start of that shoot. Uh, the, the contact is from the start of, the, of that shoot, because he gave her the camera and she was playing up with the camera. For those who can see details, it was a Nikon. So Nikon at least have one good thing. Marilyn to touch their cameras. <laughs> Again, a contact sheet from the actual from one of the actual shoots. Here, this is much more the style of uh, Avedon. So you can see that photographers, even at that time, were being influenced by each other. Like we all do. I mean, th this is something that we can't escape. We're all we're all influenced uh, by by each other. Ooh. And in fact, you see it going around in, in, in even on Facebook or on photographic competitions. You start start seeing a certain type of images, and everybody else is trying to do that image. Uh, one can't help it. Nothing nothing is original. I think it's the normal run of things. Yeah, this is Twiggy again. And as, as you can see, Tw Twiggy, what her things, what her uh, benefits were, that she she could sort of she looks she would look good in any any type of dress or clothes. Very skinny. It was the time that where uh, everybody started looking at models as a very skinny um, skinny models, and she was just the right one for the right time. She had good contacts in London. And from one photographer to the other, she could always uh, bring out b really good pictures. So then she moved on. You can see that the style of Twiggy is all the time even changing. Uh, we come to one I think that few of you will have heard of her. Uh, again, an American female photographer who's, who was Deborah Terbill. And Deborah Terbill again had a big influence on fashion photography, particularly in the States. Uh, here, she, she used to, uh, ag again, you will notice one thing. And sometimes today, I think this, this, uh, this thing is being, is being uh, missed by most photographers today. Most, most photographers and beginners who, who I meet are usually all fixated on equipment. I need lights, I need that, I need the shift lens, I need the big flash, I need whatever. And you'll notice that most photographers early on in photography managed to come out with really um, eye-catching pictures and, that, and stop it, pictures that would stop you with very, very little equipment. Usually they would just have one camera and one, one lens or two lenses. So this is my, my thing also, my take from this. I always try to say it. It's not your equipment which makes you a, a good photographer. It, it's what you have in your brain. It's, it's how to think. It's, how, it's what lengths you will go to get to, to do a picture. Um, so please don't be sort of um, put back because you don't have the right equipment. Look at most of these pictures that I've shown you today from the start to now. Everybody could nearly have taken them. You know, it's just the idea. I mean, you could have taken everything, even with a Polaroid camera, to be honest, and get the same result. It's the idea which is a winner. Okay, these are all, are all third drills images. Again, she would she would do like uh, um, Actually, very much like Bourdain as well, sort of pictures seem, most of her images seem like um, a small snippet from a film. Uh, but she would go more, more natural. And then she had series like these, which were, you, which you can see were very elaborate. You know, a lot of props, a lot of people, nice houses. But from one image to another, I think you can gauge that how, how versatile she was, how flexible she was. Actually, you can't really pin her down to a, to a style, although this type was very similar to what she would be. She, she used to like using an, a good number of models, not a single model. A lot of her work features 
three or four or five models in, in it. Uh, another American photographer, maybe you haven't heard of him, Richard Traeger in, in USA. Again, he's a very well-known figure. Died very, very early as well. I mean, he didn't, uh, he died around uh, less sighting than 40 years. Um, and he was also working uh, a lot in Britain. And again, at the peak of Twiggy's, Twiggy's career, he was there uh, taking photographs of her. Uh, in fact, Reger is known for actually making Twiggy popular. He was the first one who really started putting out her, her photographs. And then naturally continue with, with other models. Jill, Jill Cannington is also a very well-known model. 60s, 70s, uh, British model. And these are all triggers models. Again, you can see that sometimes uh, they tend to copy each other, as I said, or take ideas from each other. But what, what usually happens when the photographer has some sense, he takes an idea from here, from there, maybe from three places, and then makes it a bit his own. Because really nothing is... Uh, Nothing is, is original and new. This is Twiggy again in a different uh, position. Twiggy again. Vogue, a Vogue picture by Trigger. He did a lot of work for Vogue actually as well. Again, notice the 63. This was usually done uh, by by he, he used to play around with slower shutter speeds. We do it a lot today, but remember at that time it was film and you had no monitor, so you had to try and guess and play around. And usually you would have to really shoot a lot of images to get what one has needs in his mind, what has in his mind. Okay, uh, another group, sh group shot done in a studio. Vogue again imitating more or less what Everdon introduced. The lifestyle fun bits, and this is an earlier Vogue shot. Uh, this guy, uh, again, you might not have heard about him. He was uh, actually a Polish photographer, but again, made his fame in, in uh, America. Uh, his family had left Poland, rightly so, to escape the Nazis and then the Russians afterwards. And had settled in America, and he grew up there. His name is he was Chris von Wangenheim, uh, and his work was again a bit edgy. He would do pictures like this. He was a very um, famous fashion photographer, actually working a lot with uh, a lot of the fashion houses like jewelry and uh, and perfume perfumeries. Uh, here we see he used to put in also uh, he liked putting in animals together with his with his models. I don't know if the model enjoyed this, but anyway, the dog must have been well, well, Estrato. Uh, von Wankenheim was also good with color as well. And as you can see, although the picture is rather corny here, he's actually using shadows as well. The shadows of the, of the one light he is using because it's just one heavy, harsh light. He used the shadows to create uh, a different dimension. Uh, it's actually the picture is showing swimwear, Dior swimwear. And instead of going to the beach and doing like everybody else, he did this bit of photography inside. And I think it's it's not the cliche that we usually expect when we see swimwear. Uh, spectacles. This is one of his most iconic photographs taken against the New York skyline. And here one sees more, more. The, um, here is, um, here I would like to talk maybe a bit about the model. I don't know if you, you've seen her. There's even a movie of her. Her name was Gia. She was a very famous American model doing really well. And the actual movie is, is 
uh, if those who are interested could see it because it's a, it's a it's a good movie and it teaches a lot of lessons. Uh, unfortunately, the girl ruined her career with uh, with with heavy drugs and and bad company and died very young. It was a very big pity when when she died actually. This is more of his work. Again, this is Gia, who I was talking about. Uh, I quite like this image here. There's more, much more thinking, much more the thinking process shows here. And also notice a lot of people, you, a lot of photographers used to use, particularly um, from the 60s to 80s, used to use a lot the square format. Why? Because a lot of the main cameras like Hasselblad, Bronica's, uh, Mamiya would use the were very, very famous and popular for the square format. So during those 20 years, you'd see uh, a lot of this format being utilized. Grace Jones, I think you all know her. Let's get to another American photographer, Herb Ritz. 52, died in 2002, and again, his work, I think, has that that unmistakable style of somebody who really knows what he's doing. And you can see, uh, I'm going to show you quite uh, some, some images of his, and you'll see the style, how it differs, but at the same time, he's doing different subjects, but at the same time, his work is uh, has a, a a sort of stamp, a rubber stamp that, that shows it's his work. And again, here we see that it's the idea, not the equipment that makes the picture and sometimes not even the model. I'm sure some of you have seen this picture. It's one of his most iconic. I love the idea and I also love the lighting. He's taking, uh, taking it um, with the sun quite high, so so the 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 twigs are are shedding a shadow a texture on the body of the model and the model becomes actually a tree trunk uh, herbris was very artistic his work is again unmistakable i think his work was um like evidence but with another gear he went up a bit a bit more This is a famous picture uh, that he did. I'm sure, again, a lot of you have seen this picture. And another iconic one. I mean, can you get the idea how, how he really got a picture to work with nothing, really? But just using part of the dress or a piece of drape to do that. I mean, you have to be creative to see these things in your mind. Because an image is done in your mind, it's not actually done in the camera. I think Herr Britz, if I'm not mistaken, um, did a couple of Pirelli calendars. I, I would suggest you, you you have a look at them. I mean, not not physically, but but uh, on internet you should find them. Now let's go a bit on contemporary, much more towards our our time. Okay, and I'm gonna show you some work of Hiro, the Japanese photographer, who is in fact still alive and still working till this day. I mean, and here you will see a different style because um, naturally photographers, having been born and lived in in Japan are different from photographers being born in America or London. So everybody is introducing what has passed through his life. One thing I always say that we are we are what we are so different as a society and everybody, every human being is so different because of our conditioning of the way we have been, where we have been born, where we've been bred, where we've gone to school, who our parents were, blah, blah, blah. It's, the list is never ending. And also our pictures, our art comes out from what we feed our brain and our eyes with. If we feed, um, if we, we feed our brain with rubbish, if I stay enough, 
uh, reading fumetti, then that's one thing. I can't expect any good artwork coming out of me. But if I, I research, I read a lot of things, I, I look at different photographers, then that is going to actually filter through um, my photography, hopefully. And here you see, I mean, if there's one thing that the Japanese are good at, it's being weird. So here they are usually a bit a leg upon us. In fact, if you maybe maybe seen uh, see uh, magazines, fashion magazines uh, that are printed directly for the ja Japanese audience, you'll see that they are very much more. I wouldn't say creative, but but yes, uh, creative and and strange. But a lot of the pictures will stop you in your tracks because they're different. They see things in a different manner. This is a famous shot of Hiro for Tiffany Jewelers, as you know. And again, here I'm not so sure if he's done his job right. Actually, the picture is amazing and the model is amazing. But her eyes are so attractive that they nearly pull the attention from the actual jewelry, which was supposed to be the main subject. Um, so here, Hero has been torn between two, two things, uh, bringing out the actual jewelry and being taken over by the eyes of the model. This is something that sometimes happens. Uh, in fact, it's strangely, it's nearly more difficult to get a good looking model right in a commercial because usually um, you are attracted to certain things and you tend to skip or forget the obvious <laughs> sometimes and you have as a photographer one has to all the time uh, bring himself to mind what's the main subject what's the main subject it's the, the clothes it's the jewelry so the model has to be just there a mannequin not taking over the whole attention anyway that's the way i think photography from harper's bazaar and again, you see, although we're getting a bit closer, I mean, this is, we're talking 70s, 80s, still the pictures are quite simple to do. It's the idea that makes it all. Look at this one, for example. I mean, now Jerry Hall, I don't know. I mean, she, she was a, an American photographer, very famous. She was very tall. She married actually Rod Stewart, blah, blah, blah. It, if I, if even myself, if I had, I was lucky enough to have Jerry Hall as my model. I, th I don't think I would have imagined this picture because I would have been caught on shooting different pictures of her. But this guy has managed to come out with something for me, which is fine art. Now, what is fine art? We could do hours talking about what is fine art and what isn't. But for me, for example, without having to go into text, for me, this is fine art. Again, look at the way some of his pictures are done. Viewpoint, again, show people, your viewers, a different viewpoint. Something that they don't usually see. Look at this image again. Simple, but not easy to think. As I said, uh, Japanese photographers, particularly people of the caliber of uh, Hiro, are really creative and artistic. Now let's come to a guy who is still alive as well. I wouldn't say alive and kicking, but David Bailey, as you know, is a household name in UK and even around the world. Uh, he was very good friends of a friend of mine, David Facey, who we were very lucky to have in in Malta for a couple of times at MIPP conventions and, and other things. Unfortunately, Facey died around five years ago. Uh, they were they were they were all characters. They were they were part of the uh, what they call the swinging 60s and 70s scene in in London. David Bailey again was a great fashion photographer. Weird, controversial, um, but you can't. You can't jump over his work because uh, his work is, has, says that something different. Uh, this is Andy Warhol, uh, quite young. Um, Bailey was very much into portraiture. 
in fact, the last work he was doing, he went, he was very much into portraiture, he was very much into fashion, very much into nude. Um, he bordered some of, in a period, he bordered on the erotic. And last but not least, he started shooting still lives of plants. So uh, the, the last time I researched and looked him up, he was still doing this, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so you can see that a career of a photographer can go from one, one end to the other. This is a Charlotte Rampling, another famous, famous uh, actress. These are all shots by, uh, by Bailey. Chrissy Terlington was actually very famous after, uh, after Twiggy and after that, and after that other model I mentioned, whose name skips me now. Um, she was, she was very much in the London scene, and again, everybody was was taking pictures of her. She was, as you can see. Lovely model. Uh, personalities that you know, Jack Nicholson, for example. Again, very simple. This is just one light. It's just one light from the front, nearly, just slightly to towards the the right as, as Rembrandt, but not really Rembrandt light. But it works, and there's his character coming out. Jane Birkin, the French actress, sixty-nine. Other work by by him, by Bailey. Um, naturally, uh, he was in the time of the the Rolling Stones at their best, the Beatles and stuff like that. So he had the, he was very lucky to um, to shoot these people. Yeah, Dali. This proves again my point that everybody shot Dali. <laughs> Uh, so David Bailey is another another photographer that you can study, I think, which which is very his his work is very very much, and also one can study his life. Uh, I've had to actually some this version of of uh, this presentation is actually a censored one because some of the images that Bailey shot border on I didn't want to to get get into any problems with with some of you so i i left them out but if you go on internet you will you will be able and you're really interested in his work you'll be able to see more or less uh, the whole repertoire uh, arthur elgort uh, born in the usa as well in 1940 and he is still actually working to this day if i'm not mistaken taken 60 uh, he, he's nearly 90 or something like that and still doing work with photography he, he's really into it and uh, Elgort you will see that his work as well goes through a very very wide spectrum uh, of work of different subjects and he's able to really tackle a lot uh, this is the same same model I, I mentioned who We've seen already the pictures by Chris Van Van Wandenheim, Gia. And again, you're seeing what uh, El Gort was was the way he was working for Vogue, etc. I mean, arranged pictures, setups, yes, but for that time, around the the 1980s, they they worked. Uh, here you can see that there's more thought, more 99.9% .9 there would be an art director in these shoots. So uh, remember in, in America and UK, in the big cities, they don't work like us. Uh, if I usually have a studio session with a commercial and I want a commercial, usually the client hardly knows what he wants. That's one thing. Then the client wants to use his own contacts as models. I can't hire the models I want. Uh, then I have to keep to a budget. Then I have to sweep and do the coffee while while the studio session is going on. <laughs> in other places, you know, they have uh, they used to have art. Uh, they still do art directors, fashion designers. It's a whole team working. Uh, if you study, for example, the work of David LaChapelle or any Li any Libovitz, they just nearly press the trigger. Uh, all all the rest is being done by by a, by an army of people. Can we do it in Malta? No, the budgets don't allow us, but we can work in groups. And this is one thing, again, that I always try, unfortunately, to very little success, to encourage students and, and photographers to, to work together on projects. 
where don't don't go into partnerships, but work on a project with, say, let's be three or four, everybody inputting his skills on, on, on a type of shoot. And you will see how your how the quality and level of photography goes up. Because the more talented people you have around around the photo shoot, the more you can come out with ideas, with with uh, with with things that that work. Again, some later work of his. and using shadows here this is a studio which which just has a big north window north facing window and uh, who, who was with us last week we had john denton today week who was showing us his work in a studio i think the work which impressed me most was the work that was being lit up by just light coming in from from window or, or door apertures you, we don't realize how much we can work with 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 natural light. The, the unfortunate thing about natural light is that you have to your your schedule has to move with the light, not the light moves to your schedule. The advantage in in having studio lighting is because you can do work at any time. But then there, I think nothing beats natural natural light. Again, look at this strange work of Elgor. This was uh, for for a fashion house, clothes. He would come up even with different ideas. Rolling Stones again, eight to one. This is one of his most famous photographs. It's one of his like, iconic photographs where he got the model just to, to pick out of a Car roof door. Carly Kloss, another famous model, was German but worked a lot in in uh, in UK. And here you see more elaborate work of Elgort, uh, and it shows how he can move from basic setups, simple images, to much more elaborate. I would call them tableaus, actually, not 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 simple just pictures they they're all studied i'm just sometimes flipping through images so so you can see much more uh, i'll go on my the last photographer i i'm going to feature today unfortunately time we cannot drag these lectures for a long time because i mean it's not easy both on me to, to, to deliver the talk because I'm getting little feedback from uh, from who it's different than being in class and also for you to keep attention. So I'm going to keep this strictly more or less to an hour, 15 minutes. Uh, Sarah Moon, another American photographer, and uh, she used to work a lot, a lot for uh, for Casharel. Usually she would do all, all the work for them. And uh, her images have a mood in them. Uh, they are very much like uh, there was there was a famous American photographer I forgot I forgot her name at the moment it escapes me much earlier than her and it gives the same mood you know like um, softness grainy um, she used to do a lot of uh, the dark room work herself going on black and white and using also uh, toning she used to experiment a lot in the dark room. It wasn't that she got somebody else to do the darkroom work, she would do it herself. And again, you see her creativity, how different her photographs are. <coughs> Some of these images naturally are from internet, so the quality isn't that great. I always try to get the best quality I can, but sometimes some pictures you can you can only get a very small. Uh, they don't really do justice to the original net naturally. I quite like this this set. She had a very nice set for Casharel here, uh, where it's really really moody, dream, dreamy type of of images.
this reminds me of the days I was drinking too much. <laughs> but I think, again, it's very original. This is your look also at the color sense. Na naturally, um, fashion photography and commercial advertising photography around the late 60s and up to 1990s became very much oriented towards towards color. So you would find most of the work being done at those times in color. So the photographer had to have a really good color sense uh, to come out with, with different pictures because color adds its own problems. It's another dimension that you have to be careful in order to match colors, etc., etc. It's not like monochrome, black and white. Okay, you have to think because you have to think tones there. Um, because uh, a red shirt is going to look black, so you have to visualize how it's going to look in black and white. But I, I have, a, I, I feel that color is rather more difficult to come out with uh, in in uh, as a powerful photograph because there's more problems that you can run into with color again it's my opinion in fact her work Sarah Moons was very much in uh, I think there's also there was also a film on her um, her work was going a bit backwards to towards retro style as you can see she loved to do this type of images okay i will stop there